welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this act of worship this evening. We're going to begin by singing together one of the great hymns of Christendom, Guide Me, O My Great Redeemer. Decided that we would sail for Italy, 
Um, Paul had appealed to Caesar to hear his case, and eventually the time had come when it was right, right for him and others to travel. So this is what we got here in this very dramatic uh, passage. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship at Ranmaifetum, about to sail for ports along the coast of the present province of Asia. Uh, just to say we're repeating it a little later, uh, in those days the province of Asia is what we would call Asia Minor today. And it's really uh, the colours of the country of Turkey. But here that they are, they're going uh, along to these different ports. And uh, when they put out to sea, Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea of the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra uh, in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Nidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete opposite Salmone. We moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Far Havens near the town of Lassie. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement, that is after the end of September, beginning of October. So Paul warned them, men I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbour in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. When the gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave, it, gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Corda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted, hoisted it on board. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Cytus. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battery from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last 
I an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. So a very dramatic portion of God's word. And before we continue it, uh, we're going to sing together uh, this remarkable little chorus, uh, Faithful One, So Unchanging. Days, he said, 
You have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of all of them. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all, all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognise the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent them, any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. When I go to stand and sing our next hymn, there is a hope that burns within my heart.
trouble is with the most trying of circumstances we can all begin to doubt and many of us will know what the, a night time is like when either you can't get to sleep or you wake up and can't get back to sleep and all sorts of things go through the mind and uh, we need to rely, I think, and it's very easy to say, but not so easy to do, we need to rely on the Lord. So we find here that Paul is someone that we can look to to see that after his conversion he experienced God's grace in whatever circumstances came his way. And he exhibits great confidence in this most trying of situations compared to the other events recorded in Acts. Uh, Luke goes into great detail here about this dramatic storm at sea. It really is a most brilliant uh, account and it's one that we should give thanks for. Uh, I must confess that I've never heard a sermon on this chapter or any of the verses within it. So uh, it was uh, an interesting thing to come to it myself and realise that there is still much of the Bible that if I don't speak up, uh, I will never cover before I meet the Lord again. But uh, it is a wonderful thing. Now the context here to Acts 27 is that Paul has appealed to Caesar. He wanted his case held there in, in, the, um, in the royal court. The, the emperor was probably Nero. There's a little bit of debate, but I think it probably was in Nero. And so Paul is in Caesarea on the coast of Israel, a very beautiful site for those who go there. It's an amazing place to visit. The only thing that spoils it is if you look to the left, you see some sort of works. I don't know if it's cement works or whatever. So they should have banned that and moved it. But um, it is a really lovely place with Herod the Great's, uh, what remains of his palace there, jutting out to the sea. And so we find that Paul is now leaving Caesarea in Israel. And as he goes, he doesn't know what's ahead of him as we don't know what's ahead of us. And that is why our trust and our confidence should be in the Lord. Because we all have different situations in our lives. We have, though, the advantage of the complete scriptures that we can read, that we can learn if we're able to, and we can apply to what's going on. And although we don't have every specific detail spelt out that we encounter, that we are encounter we are encouraged to go to the scriptures and see the principles that are laid down. How should we live? What does God actually say? And how should we apply these things to our situation? Now we need to live our lives, I think, by the scriptures. And uh, to also, something that we don't often see, but to use your God-given common sense as well, not to take something and have a bizarre um, ending to it. But we are those who are given the scriptures and we are given, and because we've got the complete scriptures, we read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, that uh, we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in us to will and to order to fulfill his good purposes. So even though situations come with, what on earth all this about? It's because God has allowed it, God wants to use it, God wants to bring blessing to us and who knows to who other uh, we come across. And we should never forget uh, in, in life to, if you know the, the different hymns you can often, or choruses you can put um, into your mind, it does help. You, you can. Uh, Use something like that to aid your understanding, like trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. It's too often it's rele uh, relegated to a, a children's hymn. It should be for us all to understand that sort of thing. Never forget in the difficulties of life that Jesus is with us who lived, died and rose again for us. Although this may be an extreme example, and it's something I would not have wanted to go through, and I trust I don't have to go through in my, 
in my life. Um, it contains many things here in Acts 27, I'll just pick out just a few of them, uh, that we can apply in a positive way to our lives and not be left thinking that we are alone. That's the tragedy, isn't it? We often think, oh, we, we are alone, no one's ever gone through this, no one's ever had to deal with this and all the rest of it, which is obviously nonsense, but that's the way our minds work and that's the way Satan the devil often works uh, to, to bring us down. And so we are very grateful uh, to God for the scriptures. So Paul tells us here, uh, through Luke's brilliant writing, uh, that those travelling with him, that they had to understand that even though it was an extreme con or conditions, uh, that God had everything under his control, under his power, and he had not forgotten them. So we are grateful that we are told that the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that was with those people then, is still with us today. So I've got just two headings, you may see them on the sheet there. Firstly, is a frightful night in verse 18, um, because, uh, although I could have picked this up from other places, I thought verse 18 uh, really gives it to us, doesn't it? On oh, such a lovely day today and we wouldn't want anything like this, but uh, you can imagine it. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. Now, um, I don't know how many of you are excellent sailors. Um, I've been caught out once or twice. Um, I prefer sailing down. Um, the bases don't canal. We did that once at a church, and I can't remember what the occasion was. But uh, someone like Chris Duncan would need to be our guide and uh, hopefully look after us if we do go sailing out on the high sea. But it was uh, a very dramatic thing that was here. So after the bursting of the storm, Paul God's man was given advice that was ignored. And many preachers and Sunday school teachers and Christian parents and grandparents and all the rest of it, and you often find that, don't you? That you speak to people and you try and give them what the Lord word is, what he has said, uh, but through the ages many people have discovered that uh, their own views are much better than the Bible's. And uh, you sometimes hear, as some of us have, that uh, regarding Paul, well he didn't always get it right, did he? So you think, whoa, who are we to criticise God's word? We need to be very careful, don't we? But we need to be sure. We need to understand that God's word transcends the word of man. But ever since the Garden of Eden, when those there listened to Satan the devil, and when he said to them, did God say, in Genesis 3, Verse 8, it's there, isn't it? Did God say? Did God say that you're not to eat this fruit? Did God say you're not to do this? Did God say? Well, they should have replied, yes, he did, but instead they listened. And that is all often the trouble, isn't it? It's the way of the world. People do what they think is best. And so we find in verse 17 here that, uh, that they decided to do what was best. Uh, they were obviously using their experience. Uh, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. So it must have been a, a very dramatic uh, situation to be in. To be wet, to be cold, to be frightened, to be fed up. It was one of those things that uh, really, I'm surprised no one's made a film of this. I think it would be a terrific film, but there we go. So if you know of any Christian filmmakers, this would be a good one. But uh, here, here we find that uh, they wanted the ship to hold together when they should have held together, held together to the word of God. And then we get in verse 27, on the 14th night, they said they were approaching land at midnight, we are told. So we can, as we skip through this passage, you can actually see all these different pointers that are given to us. Uh, they knew that they're position was precarious. Sailors travelling with Jonah 
could have empathised with this. I don't know how far Jonah got in his vessel with the others, we, we're not told. But he was certainly in the same, if you look at it for, for, from space, the same geographic area. And uh, Jonah knew how dangerous things were becoming uh, when he was uh, there sailing. And so we find that here as well, in verse 27, the 14th night still being driven across the Adriatic Sea reminds us how dangerous it was for them. It was truly frightening, really frightening. I don't think we can underplay this at all. Those like me who have poor sea legs wouldn't have survived very long, I don't think. Uh, I do all right up to a point, but then if it gets really violent, no thank you. But uh, many of them may have been in despair with what was going on. One year, uh, uh, on one tour we did um, to Turkey, we actually took a group across to the island of Patmos. And it was lovely going there, but coming back, the tide had turned. And it was ferocious, uh, it seemed to go on forever. I think it was about two hours, three hours that we were there being buffeted and bumped around. And, uh, I was grateful when we got into a harbour and uh, we could try and somehow uh, get these sea legs back. Uh, try walking on land straight after you've been in such a situation. It's quite laughable really, but uh, uh, there it is. And it would have been like that in more extremists with these people. And uh, I had had enough after a few hours. These people were stuck here for days. And then we get the drama of the incredible experience of being played out. How many people witnessed what they did in verse 29, the dropping of the anchors. It was happened and uh, it became imminent to Paul that there was peril here um, they were probably trying to stabilise what was going on, but uh, the actions of those who were in distress felt by the crew and passengers must have been simply appalling at this point. We read in Jonah 1.5, uh, I'm going back to the Old Testament account, that all the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And I'm sure it would have happened here. We, we do know of different gods that they uh, um, used to speak to. And so it reminds us here to apply it to our lives, just to step back. When life gets tough for us, what do we do? Where do you turn? What do you look for? The reality of our beliefs or lack of them, will rapidly surface if we are in a really difficult situation. We find out what we truly believe. And that is something that we ought to consider. I trust all of our hopes are in God, the Father, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and God, the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. As uh, I was almost tempted to choose this, but uh, you can look it up and sing it yourself when you get home, but there is a wonderful hymn that goes with your anchor hold in the storms of life. And that is true, isn't it? You know, we may be going through real difficulties right now that no one else knows about. But with our anchor hold, are we those who have put their trust in the Lord? So if we haven't done so before, we need to give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to confess our sins. We need to receive his offer of total forgiveness and base all that we do on his word and live for him. Tough times will come. I think we sang that this morning. Tough times will come, but better that his presence is with us than trying to rely on what we think is best. Then we see in verse 29 that these people on board the vessel prayed for daylight. And uh, that is a very telling little phrase, isn't it? Praying for daylight. Do you ever feel like that? That uh, something has happened and uh, 
You, you can't make out what's in your room or in your house. It's all dark. If you're able to put light on, it all becomes clear. But uh, that is what um, they were looking for. Because people's weaknesses are often revealed when times are tough. So we find here these different things that are going on. And uh, if you look at verse 30, uh, in an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow bow. But uh, Paul obviously knew what was going on, and he alerted uh, those in charge, and said, look, if these guys leave us, we really are stuck. There is no hope that God uh, is the one who saves us, but he also uses that which he has given us, human help. That's what I trust we have, especially in this church fellowship, that we do seek to help one another day by day. So the centurion, verse 31, heard Paul's words and trusted in the word of God for their salvation. Paul was telling them about all that God had done, uh, how God had visited them, how he had received this word from the Lord. And so um, they were to look to him for their salvation. Now, not being a medical in any way or a nutritionist, I can't really imagine what verse 33 is like, 14 days without food. I think you'd be very hungry, um, but maybe they try and eat it and they keep anything down because the old sea was buffeting around and the wind was blowing. So we find that they, uh, they were in a sorry state, we physically, mentally, and no doubt many of them spiritually as well. But then in verse 33, we're also told that as dawn was approaching, isn't that lovely? There is hope given to them. Hope in the morning. As dawn approached, Paul got up and said, eat. What's going to happen next? Although I've guaranteed that you will all be saved, I still need you to have enough strength to fulfill what it will be coming next, even though we don't know particularly what it would be at that juncture. And so, eat. We need strength. And for us, if we're Christian people, God's word is our spiritual food. Do we starve ourselves by neglecting it? I've got so many other things to do. Do we neglect the nourishment that it brings and provides day by day? So we are told not to trust in our own resources but God's. So we have there in verse 39 then the second heading, very briefly, open the morning, whilst not undergoing such things, and many can relate to a, a fretful night, and then a, a measure of hope with the coming of a new day. Hopefully things can be put into perspective. Daylight came, but they were still cold, they were hungry, wet through and fearful, and all conspired to leave them probably in a very sorry state. It's interesting in verse 35, when we're, uh, when we're leading us around the table of the Lord shortly, that uh, bread was uh, distributed after Paul had given thanks to God for it. It's like just a, a little reference to uh, the Last Supper here. So Paul gave thanks to God, as Jesus often did before the feeding of the 5,000, he gave thanks to God. And so we thank God for these things that are given to us. We are to trust God's word. And then Paul made a really extreme statement. How on earth could anyone do this? Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head, verse 38. Really? Are you sure? So Paul said, yes. So they were able to reach the beach alive, because when God speaks, faith is given to those who hear and put it into practice. Faith immediately proceeds to hush our doubts by 
Bunyan brilliantly has it in the first part of uh, Pilgrim's Progress about Doubting Castle as a strong, terrible stronghold uh, with giant despair living there. And many of us are victim to these things if we don't look to the Lord. The physically impossible was available to them. They would survive. But you've got to have the strength because you've got to swim if you can. If you can't, attach yourself to something, planks or whatever else it may be. Uh, if it had been me, I would have looked for someone who was a strong swimmer and attached myself to them. But uh, it must have really been absolutely incredible. And so the big thing, it obviously, here is that God's grace gets us through many a situation. And we can testify to it if we're honest, if we've known the Lord for a while, that he's been with us. Just because one crisis has come and gone, it doesn't mean we won't face others, any of us. We see in the very next chapter, in verse 28, uh, they are safely on shore. And then, as if we haven't had enough, in 28 verse 3, a viper, a snake, attaches itself to Paul's hand. Goodness me, I've had it. No, Paul was still trusting the Lord. So in verse 4 uh, of 28, even though people say, and here is the, the earthly logic, um, well, obviously Paul must be a murderer. And then, even though he's escaped the sea, he must die. Uh, which was an awful thing. Uh, in verse 4, he escaped the sea goddess, justice. But uh, the snake has got, them, got him. So when God is at work, worldly wisdom looks for a rational explanation. The big picture we have is that Paul eventually ends up in Rome. He is imprisoned house prison, but maybe something else as well, and he probably met his end by the blow of an executioner's sword. It's, uh, it's well attested, but not in the scriptures. That is what happened. So what will our testimony be? How grateful to God that we are able to come uh, before him, to come around the table to remember what Jesus has done for us, to remember how he empowers us. I love Paul's testimony in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. So we give thanks to God for his mercy. Before we come around the table of the Lord, we're going to sing this lovely hymn of Timothy Dudley Smith's. And... Uh, can we hear say from the shadow of the Lord? Um, any of you who know Yan, who's a minister up at Binston, is now moved down south. Um, he was uh, Dudley Smith's uh, son in law, so I'll give you that for nothing. But hear this wonderful hymn, Safe in the Shadow of the Lord.
by the showing us a night of anxiety that was followed by a morning of hope. For we know that the Lord Jesus himself experienced a night of anguish, as Matthew records for us in his gospel. But Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, will this cup be taken from me? Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then he came back and again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sins. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayal. We know the horrors that followed uh, what happened to Jesus over that following day. His arrest, the travesty of a trial, being tortured and then being nailed to a cross where he died. But we know that following that, on the third day, there was a morning that brought hope to all of creation when Jesus triumphed over sin and death when he rose again. Through his death and resurrection, there was the promise of forgiveness of sins and life eternal for all who trust in him. So let us confess our sins now in prayer, in the sure and certain knowledge that in Jesus they are forgiven. Shall we pray? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against one another in thought and word and deed. In the evil that we have done and in the good that we have not done. Through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate faults. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. To help us to remember all that he was going to do for us, earlier in that night of anxiety, Jesus gave his disciples and us a simple meal as a way to remember his sacrifice for us. Matthew again recalls. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine, from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Phil and Liz are now going to give thanks for the bread and the cup. Father God, we thank you that the Lord Jesus came and lived uh, as a human uh, among us. And Lord, we thank you that he was willing to fulfill your will when he went to the cross when he died for our sins. We thank you that in the garden, despite his anguish and distress, that he 
was faithful um, to your plan for him um, to save us. Lord, we thank you for his body broken for us, but we remember in the bread, we thank you that he willingly went to the cross to pay the price that we deserve to pay for our sin. But Lord, we thank you that you rose him to new life and that he ran to you. Thank you for this in his name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are very aware that the only reason why we can come together around this table now is because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Thank you that these cups here in front of us represent the cup that Jesus used with his disciples at the Last Supper. And as the drink has been poured out this evening for us all, thank you that this represents how Jesus' blood was spilled to his death. We understand that only blood from a living sacrifice was needed to confirm and seal a, leading, a legally binding covenant. Thank you, Lord, for the new covenant we now have with you only because Jesus was obedient to you and willing to shed his own blood for us, even though he was completely without sin and innocent, and knowing that we had rejected him as well. Help us, Lord, to always be thankful for this eternal gift that you have given us. In his name, Amen. Amen. trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, then do please partake in the elements as they come around. If you feel for whatever reason that doesn't describe you at the moment, or if there is another reason why you would prefer not to take part, then please just pass uh, on the elements as they come by you. As has been our custom uh, in recent times, we will be serving the bread and the cup together. Please take the bread and eat it as soon as you receive it but retain the cup and we will drink it together as a reminder that we are one body of which Christ is the head. Come and let us drink and eat around the table of the Lord. The blood of Christ shed before us. Dear Lord, we thank you for this meal of remembrance. We thank you for the time we can take to focus on all that was achieved through Jesus' death and resurrection. And we thank you that just as Jesus did when sharing with his disciples the night he was betrayed, we can look forward to the time when we will dwell with him forever in paradise. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace.